Eric here, and in this video I'm going to share with you the process I go through to learn piano pieces. It's going to be a mix of information I've acquired from over 10 years of piano performance and strategies I develop on my own to improve the efficiency of my music learning. Before we begin though, let me just introduce myself so you can understand why I'm making this video. You can go to this timestamp if you want to skip the intro, but I suggest hearing it to have some context. I'm currently a computer science student in my final year close to graduation. Before university, I had competed and won in numerous piano competitions, some at the national and international level. After several initial years of focus on my university degree, I decided that I wanted to revisit what I had achieved previously, but I didn't want to continue with it in a competitive environment anymore. I just wanted to explore freely. When I had participated in competitions in the past, the repertoire that was permitted was extremely limited and homogeneous amongst all competitions. That is for reasons of practicality, I understand, but this meant that pianists who strived for the fame and rewards that came with major competitions wins all played the same works to audiences. And to me, personally, that is rationally unbearable. This approach for the industry satisfies their target demographic but like all populist approaches, easy appeal self-reinforces in popularity while the opposite slowly disappears into obscurity. So what I have been doing for the past one year is systematically, consistently, and at an amazing pace, learning unconventional pieces at my own pace and leisure. They're all relatively obscure, but the creativity of these works are awe-inspiring. While they are all mostly top tier in difficulty, that is a product of the complexity that arises from the creativity. Here are some examples of pieces I've recorded with the length of the piece and the time it took for me to learn them. Overall, the audience so far has been amazingly supportive of these obscure works and have really helped in moral support. Naturally, as well, people have had questions about how I am doing what I'm doing. Since I have found the time to explain things in detail at this point in time, I'll try to self-reflect, analyze my own mental processes, and explain things to everyone. I hope you all find the remainder of this video enlightening in some way. Thank you. that I'll be using is from Le Jardin Parfumé, a nocturne by Kaikostru Sarabji. This 11 second excerpt is from the full 22 and a half minutes of the piece. It is complex enough for me to explain several aspects of my learning process, technical and interpretational, though this video is mostly dedicated to the technical side. I'll go over some of the special features of the score in view first. The third staff has a special symbol that indicates that all the notes on that staff are played an octave higher. The notation is highlighted if expressed as this, 
means that an x number of notes should be played in the same time as y number of notes with normal durations. Lastly, accidentals do not propagate as there are no consistently notated bar lines to cancel them out over time. But you'll see that the composer writes some redundant accidentals anyway for clarity. Let's approach this passage as if I'm starting to learn a piece. Firstly, something like this can hardly be start read at full speed. If I tried, I would be making lots of mistakes and progressing quite slowly. So it's best to just take things separately by hand. Two of the key ideas of my process is information abstraction and pre-processing. Information abstraction can be thought of as increasing the total number of concepts when analyzing the music, but coupled with pre-processing, it reduces the amount of real-time processing when performing the music. I will gradually explain what this means. For the right hand here, before we approach how to practice it, we can look for simple patterns. The first is patterns of convergence and divergence. Take half a minute or so and see that there are clearly sections within the run where the oscillations converge and diverge. There are four of these sections. It's not necessary to think too rigorously of whether it perfectly fits the criteria. Use your subconscious reaction. Secondly, we have the idea of broken chords. They need not be actual simple chords you can immediately name, but when played all together, they should not be close to forming a cluster. Rather, having some close resemblance to a major, minor, augmented, diminished, dominant, or some variant with a seventh included is enough. For example, this one is a F sharp minor chord with a G added. This one is a F major chord with a G added. This one is a partial dominant chord rooted at F with an E added. Or, if you prefer, because people's minds can work differently, a major seventh chord rooted at F with an E flat added, and so on. Keep in mind that I don't assign harmonic significance to these identified harmonies. They are simply standalone. As well, there is no harm in some overlap of the patterns, but try to keep the density of the overlap as low as you can. For the first two points, I would also like to add that the first note of each pattern has special significance. Whenever you read the score from left to right, your mind should be trained quick enough to immediately identify and take action to the pattern. For the third point, there is the concept of significant jumps. By jumps, I mean intervals. These are typically at the boundaries between the already highlighted patterns. The reason for identifying these jumps is to set landmarks when reading the score. During a performance, your eyes, if you're a pianist, are generally only partially focused on the score, if you are not memorizing. And even for the moments that they are, it is not a crisp image. Peripheral vision approximates hand position and performance anxiety can tear up the eyes. There is a lot to keep track of, so setting boundaries can be an essential tool. For the patterns I've mentioned so far, ideally the pattern length should be around 3 to 10 notes. We as humans are not optimized to be able to instantaneously and accurately count large clusters of things like other primates. As well, ensure that you can quickly identify the pattern you've decided on in real time. Okay, so we've dissected the right hand. On to the left hand. In this contained section, some quick common sense will tell you that the 4 for 3 grouping is nonsensical. You've got 6th 8th notes in the left hand that perfectly match the 24 32nd notes in the right hand. It must be an engraving error unless you have an absurd case that the 4 in 4 for 3 is referring to 4 dotted quarter notes. However, that is not of importance at the moment. It will in a bit. Right now, for simplicity's sake, the rhythm can be ignored. This is just an opportunity to mention that I always try to play to my hand's natural strengths, which are my thumb, index finger, and the middle finger. So rather than play the trills in the hand positions which would match the broken chord, I simply used my stronger fingers to execute the trills, which are noticeably short in duration. So the transference timing between the trills is warranted. This tip is quite obvious, but it's possible to be very, very creative with this. Moving on, the strategies I use for this passage for positioning are encoded by the appearance of the piano keyboard, which, to be specific, is the black and white keys and their respective clusterings. For this trill, I see that the E flat is on the boundary with its gap in the black keys. For this trill, I see that the F sharp is on the boundary with the same gap, but on the other side, and so on. More on this later in the video. 
Lastly, before we move on to the next topic, I'm going to fill out the remainder of the fingerings and coordination for the excerpt, but I'll note some things that stand out to give you the general gist. So, as I hinted previously, I treat all notes and staves as hand-independent, unless really pressured by the composer in an explicit way. For example, here, the first thought is to cross the arms. The reach from crossing the arms is quite uncomfortable though, so why not take advantage of the positioning of the hands? This chord does not need to be physically held so the left hand can quickly move into position to take over. Then the right hand is in the vicinity of these chords, so it all works out. Afterwards, the converse is true for this part. Another example is here. Why assign this note to the left hand? Well, first, again, the left hand is in the vicinity of the note and the chords before the note need not be physically held. But more importantly, likely, the only convenient way of playing the sequence of notes is through this fingering or this other one. However, notice that the hand condenses and span from the crossover and it needs to immediately expand again. There are technical exercises that can help you practice the skill, but why do something harder than is theoretically necessary? So, take the A in the left hand, which still gives it plenty of time to move down to this chord. My point is, minute observations like this can save practice time. The next section is dedicated to tackling effective practice strategies for something complex like this. For most pieces by Sarabji and other Romantic era and later composers, it is the ideas that matter foremost, sometimes ahead of perfection, in the rendering of what's written in the score. In the snippet of the score we covered in detail earlier, playing all the notes in precisely perfect and consistent metronomic time is both a waste of time and is likely undesirable to the ears, as it will sound too mechanical. So, fruiting from the principle that it is the idea that matters, because the duration of each 30 seconds note between the 10A group and 28A24 group are not that dissimilar, then the idea is the 10A group should sound slightly faster than the 28A24 group. You can do the math, it's just simple ratios. Though, in practice, nobody really cares if things are slightly off, and I only mean slightly. For practice methodology, use coincidence between the hands as a starting point and the past duration of an eighth note as your tool. Consider the pulse at these two points to be your time reference for the next part, which is slightly trickier. But let's finish up this part first. The 10A group can be halved into two 5-4 groups, though this should only be a division for practical purposes. When thinking about artistic expression, the 10A grouping may have some styling repercussions. The problem is thus decomposed into timing 5 against 4 between the hands. With the particular speed of the passage, the precise details of polyrhythmic timing become unnoticeable. Use this to your advantage. While I can describe how I approach this isolated second of the piece, I'll outline the general method I use, and this is strictly for short sections of fast moving notes moving polyrhythmically. First, establish a fixed time frame for all the notes to fit in. Use the side of the polyrhythm that has fewer notes to establish a firm rhythmic basis. Become familiar with the bass rhythm by practicing it within the time frame. Practice it until you can hear the notes in your head, and not only do your fingers fit the notes, but your arm moves in a consistent and natural arc to match the notes. This is an indicator that muscle memory is kicked in. Next, practice the alternate rhythm within the time frame. Repeat all the steps I described with the bass rhythm, this time with the alternate rhythm. Then, attempt to play both the bass and alternate rhythms together in the time frame. Fail repeatedly if it is sufficiently complex, but gradually, and this is the most critical part, attempt to coalesce the sound in your head. As well, you should be able to achieve a mental visualization of the fingerings, hand positioning, and any other forms of abstractions I will have covered in this video. At the moment you can merge everything together in your head, you should have greater ease performing the polyrhythm smoothly. A modified approach is to handle situations where the time frame is long and plenty of notes are involved. There is a principle that I use to practice these types of situations, and I'll note now that it perfectly applies to this next assortment of notes. The principle is that in the flurry of notes, it is difficult for anyone to perceive the fractional timings between the rhythms in high precision. Like, suppose I have two notes like this and my objective is to play a note halfway between the notes. 
Easy. No problem. But how about one third of the way? Also, no problem. But how about 0 0.375 of the way? That's 3 eighths, but pretty close to one third. As you approach more and more complex polyrhythmic ratios, and the duration between the two reference notes I mentioned decreases, these fractional differences become of complete insignificance, unless you're a non-keyboard percussionist. Though, don't dismiss the composer's purpose in creating such groupings, as it has significance in approaching artistic expression. So, back on track, the general rule I use is that a fraction of one-sixth, one-fifth, one-fourth, one-third, and one-half, and their multiples less than one, is close enough for the polyrhythm to sound accurate and evenly dispersed. Do some math for the polyrhythmic ratios and select the fraction closest to what you've calculated. Certainly there will be exceptions, but this is already a critical simplification. So recall earlier that I skipped the discussion about the engraving issue with the polyrhythmic grouping. Well, I'll say now that it really doesn't matter that much. You can treat it as such with some simple mathematical ratios, with which you also need to apply it to the right hand, but I can assure you with or without compression, the function of the passage remains intact. I won't go into detail in this video, but just trust me on this for now. So next, take advantage of the engraving. Let me reiterate that a core concept of my methods is to perform a sort of information pre-processing beforehand. Think of the engraving and its physical dimensions and note dispersal as the information pre-processing. It is done to reduce complicated rhythms and counterpoint by transferring some of the information to the score. An even more generalized observation is that muscle memory is a form of pre-processing to the mind that can handle the incoming load during performance. An analogy that sort of works with computer science is the idea of compiled programming languages versus interpreted languages. Compiled programming languages are converted to machine-native instructions beforehand, which allows them to outcompete interpreted languages in runtime since they are converted to instructions at runtime. So, finishing off the practice method for this section, practice the bath rhythm until approaching full intended speed. Then, reduce the speed and play the alternate rhythm exactly where you see the notes. Low precision is fine. Gradually increase the speed again, and you'll notice that your mind will naturally start spacing the rhythm. This is how you can play complex polyrhythms in some circumstances without using complex mnemonics. In this second to last major section, I will, as quickly as I can, go through the remaining abstractions and pre-processing steps I used to learn pieces. I'll even provide some visuals for some of the approaches. So, first, this is obvious, but still worth explicitly mentioning, and that is approximation or interpolation of hand placement. This is more of a real-time performance consideration. When I'm looking at the score, things outside of the part of my field of view that is perfectly clear gradually become blurrier with distance. This is a property of human vision. So the scatter of notes becomes a blobby mess, but I can still pin where things are approximately. This information is then used to coordinate hand positioning and preemptively set aside some expectation for phrasing and expression. The key point here is that focused on a small set of notes does not make it easier to translate that information in your brain to action items. Suppose your mind is like a lookup table, then having a more refined search using a larger frame of reference, even if some of the details are fuzzy, improves your ability to retrieve action items corresponding to the frame of reference. Next, what I touched upon earlier is hand contraction and dilation. Now, I can notate the score like this, and it can provide some aid in performance as it does an underfit or compression of the information, but hand contraction and dilation is actually another form of information processing. For me, it is the product of factors like hand position, wrist rotation, power and or weight of the touch against the keys, and playing speed. All these together contain enough information for me to map with very precise detail what I see in the score to 3D physical orientations of my hands and arms as if I'm actually playing. This takes time and is done later than sooner and more subconsciously than consciously, but that itself becomes a fallback resource during performance if your mind accidentally loses focus on the music.
This next one is an extension to the previous strategy. I call this next concept the sparse visualization of the black and white keys, used mostly with fast passages and chords. What I mean is the following through some examples. Take this score for example. Instead of thinking about every note as their letters on the scale, go for aggregate counts and interval-based decompositions. You've got two white keys and two black keys. Black keys are at the top of the chord, clustered together. And there is a wide interval separation between these three groupings. The black keys are elevated higher than the white keys, so when rolling the chord, your thumb should angle upward. This side view cross-section illustrates this better. Since black and white is binary on the piano, it's similar to remembering a binary sequence. Lastly, note to ignore all the keys in between, but to remember boundaries in the sprouting note. Here are more examples. Finally, we have come to macroscopic patterns. These are like the cherry on top. First is melody-based patterning. I won't go through my process of determining these patterns, but I'll quickly describe them. Remember that I grouped sections of convergence and divergence? Well, notice that the frequency of these groups increases. I'll refer to this as stretto. Next, we have an ascending climb of five note groups. Remember, it's just macroscopic information used for general guidance. Next, a three semitone shift occurs if these were in the same octave range. Even though it's two octaves apart, hand positioning techniques from earlier will cut out that additional patterning consideration. Next, again, stretto occurs. Finally, this one's a weak memory tip, but the groups of two and three, pretty obvious stuff. Secondly, after melody-based patterning, we have harmony-based patterning. Again, this is a repetition of what I pointed out earlier in the first section. Wherever you see a simple harmony or interval you find significant, make a mental note of it. I won't go over this as it is pretty self-explanatory for most people with a music background. Congratulations to every person who has made it all the way to the last section. It's been a long journey, but if you take some time to reflect, you'll notice that I haven't directly addressed the real question from commenters. All these forms of analyses and strategies present a clear way of parsing the music, but how do I learn things quickly? How do I apply these methods in real time? Well, the secret is concurrency. I gradually build myself up as I go. I set provisional patterns based on predictions. However, this video has gone on long enough on its own, so I'll make a part two video with regards to expression and, inter and interpretation, where I will do a step-by-step -step walkthrough at the end explaining what I mean by concurrency. As you can see, something as short as this 11 second passage is absolutely packed with information and practice strategies. However, even though it's this packed, what I've described is not the full extent of the things I do to learn pieces. The strategies in this video is specific to the passage. So, if you want more of this in the future, let me know by liking, subscribing, or commenting. Your support for this channel is vital and appreciated. Thank you all once again for your attention, and I hope you've learned something new from this video.